Currently making the rounds is the story of the Ryugu asteroid samples and how one of them accidentally became contaminated by researchers. But the story is actually much deeper and more mysterious than what is generally being reported, and the whole thing offers interesting insights into the search for extraterrestrial life. In 2018, JAXA, Japan's state space agency, began a remarkable robotic exploration of the asteroid 162173 Ryugu with the Hayabusa 2 mission. This ambitious mission continued a program of sample return missions that started with Hayabusa 1, which was the first mission to return pristine samples directly from the surface of an asteroid for study. This is important work because while we have plenty of material from asteroids falling as meteorites, they rarely are particularly pristine. Any weathering, even just a single rainfall, changes the equation for a meteorite, and even if it's picked up immediately after a fall, it's already contaminated. The Earth microbes are colonizing and the oxygen is oxidizing the moment it hits the atmosphere. This means that sample return missions from asteroids are the only way to obtain truly pristine samples for analysis in a clean room here on Earth. The mission is a success. The samples were returned in 2020 and the spacecraft is moving on to another target asteroid, with the mission continuing until at least 2031. Interestingly, these asteroid sample return missions also give us a unique set of images, those of the surface of asteroids. This is the surface of Ryugu, and to me, are as interesting as the images from the surface of the Moon, Venus or Mars, because asteroids too are legitimate alien landscapes but in a much lower gravity environment. Ryugu turned out weird. This asteroid wasn't even discovered until 1999, and it actually is at some point in the future a potentially dangerous asteroid, because it's a member of the Apollo group of near-Earth asteroids and crosses Earth's orbit. If it ever hits Earth, however, it would not be on the level of the end Cretaceous dinosaur killer. That asteroid was 10 to 15 kilometers wide whereas Ryugu is 900 meters. Still, it would mess Earth's day up for a bit and form a crater. A lot of science has already been done on the samples, and Ryugu seems to have had a rather odd, wide-ranging history. The isotopic composition of the samples suggests an outer solar system origin, forming about 2 million years after the general formation of the solar system. The samples are rich in deuterium and nitrogen-15 along with abundances of titanium, chromium, and molybdenum, all pointing to the outer solar system, when that area was still full of debris and gas. Then it gets weird. The samples also reveal that grains within the samples can only have formed at high temperatures, a thousand degrees Celsius, for a sustained amount of time. This indicates that the asteroid somehow migrated inward, and spent time very close to the sun before migrating back out to where it is. This is partly the reason that one hypothesis for Ryugu is that it's actually an extinct comet, rather than an asteroid, like something from the asteroid belt. Though the distinction between a comet and an asteroid is a very blurry one, they bear a lot of the same attributes, and a dead comet can be called an asteroid, and an asteroid that somehow outgasses and forms a coma becomes a comet. The samples are apparently extremely good at preserving magnetic field data, and are surprisingly soft which might also suggest a more cometary early origin. But asteroids too can be soft. There are stone meteorites I've seen that will literally crumble in your hand, yet others are extremely strong, like marble. There is also evidence of the action of liquid water in Ryugu's past. Heating up to 50 degrees Celsius happened soon after Ryugu left the outer solar system, and this resulted in the formation of water-altered rock, the silicates became hydrated, and the iron turned into magnetite. There is also evidence that Ryugu was once part of a much larger object, as much as 100 kilometers original size. Then a roughly 10 kilometer impactor shattered it, and Ryugu is a chunk left over from that collision. Where things really get interesting are the further chemical analyses of the samples. Uracil was detected in the samples, which is one of the four components of RNA. You don't need life for this, but RNA needs it. Another find was 20 identified amino acids present in the samples. Also found was vitamin B3. Again, not a product of life, but used by it. 
meaning that an asteroid such as this might have delivered some of those components to Earth early in its history and may have contributed to abiogenesis. Now most of the sample inventory was not contaminated, just one, and indeed they serve basically as a confirmation of an open question. We find meteorites very much like the Ryugu samples in the form of carbonaceous chondrites. These meteorites are of great interest, actually to the point of being spooky. Here I'll tell the tale of two carbonaceous chondrites and the implications of what they might mean and how this relates to Ryugu. Carbonaceous chondrites are rare as far as meteorites go, and are far outweighed by other types of chondrites. They are stone meteorites, and as their name implies, they are carbon rich. One specific meteorite fall, however, is not rare in itself. It was observed to fall on February 8, 1969, a time of great interest in space as Apollo 11 launched in the summer of that year. And one of its missions was the retrieval of lunar space rocks. The Yende meteorite broke up in the atmosphere over the Mexican state of Chihuahua in the area of Pueblito de Allende. The meteorite fell around 1 a.m. and was witnessed for hundreds of miles around by residents of that area of Mexico. The meteorite when it entered was the size of a car and about two tons of materials were recovered, some of it almost immediately. Numerous stones were found, all covered in the characteristic fusion crust that meteorites get when burning through the upper atmosphere, which means that this particular meteorite detonated and fragmented very high up. Allende showed some strange things. So what characterizes chondrites is the presence of chondurals, which are basically tiny pebbles that formed in the early days of the solar system, and then accreted together to become an asteroid. Allende's chondurals show tiny black marks very tiny, trillions per centimeter, that seem to be from radiation damage. This is also seen in lunar rocks, but not Earth rocks, showing that Earth had an atmosphere and magnetic field at the time that shielded it, as happens today. Whatever happened to cause this mystery, it would have been cosmic radiation from somewhere that only occurred for a short time and then stopped. Whatever it was, it happened after the chondrules had solidified, but before the accretion of cold material in the early stages of the solar system's asteroid formation. It gets deeper, so the meteorite also contains isotopes of calcium, barium, and neodymium that show ratios indicating that they came from somewhere else, rather than the clouds of dust and gas the solar system formed from. This actually supports the hypothesis that this star system was once very close to a supernova going off, and that the shock waves from it actually triggered the collapse and formation of the solar system. Further work revealed evidence of aluminum-26, which is a rare isotope with a short half-life. This evidence together allowed researchers to date the supernova to less than 2 million years before the formation of the solar system. That's very conspicuous indeed. And there are others. Isotope ratios of krypton, xenon, and nitrogen are also off, and not seen in the solar system normally in isotope ratios. This supports the notion that this star system was subject to one or more supernovas early on, and may not have been triggered into forming when it did had that not happened. Something very violent once happened near the star system, and indeed possibly to other nearby star systems in the sun's birth cluster. But ultimately the work that was done with Allende was limited by the equipment at the time, when it was a fresh fall, and its exposure to Earth's environment. It's now been on this world for a very long time. The Ryugu samples get past that, with the care that was taken to keep them pristine and isolated. The other meteorite fell just after the Apollo 11 mission in September of 1969, near Murchison, Victoria, Australia. This carbonaceous chondrite was also observed to fall by residents, and reportedly stopped car engines. This is not well supported, just accounts, but meteorites contrary to popular belief actually can produce a type of electromagnetic pulse through atmospheric effects that might do that. About 100 kilograms was collected and this meteorite smelled of ether when it was first found. There were organic compounds everywhere in it, but again it was contaminated. Interestingly, the oldest material we have in our possession is from this meteorite. It is pre-solar grains, 
that are even older than Allende and go back as far as 5.5 billion years. Murchison was loaded with amino acids, and most evidence points to the interior of the fragments being pristine. But there was always a pall hanging over it all, that they were exposed to the environment of Earth. This makes samples like the Ryugu samples that much more important for confirmation purposes. The contamination story with the Ryugu materials begins with a single small particle from the samples. The samples were in a hermetically sealed chamber inside the reentry vehicle, and were only opened in a pure nitrogen environment, in a very strict clean room to prevent contamination. Everything seems to have been done correctly. The tools used were sterile, and the airtight nitrogen environment was preserved. This particular sample from the larger sampling somehow became contaminated. It was embedded in an epoxy resin block, so it could be used in a scanning electron microscope. While the sample was being studied, what were described as filaments and rods of organic matter started appearing, which were interpreted as filament-producing microorganisms. The profile of the structures looked like known terrestrial species. The abundance of the filaments changed over time, which indicated a prokaryote growing and declining. That, however, did not eliminate the possibility that the microorganisms were not contamination, but indigenous to the asteroid. The work done in population statistics made an earthly origin much more likely. The fact is, NASA has done everything possible to sterilize their probes and landers, particularly at Mars, and it's proven difficult. A number of instances exist that certain species can actually adapt and use the cleaning fluids used to eliminate bacteria and turn it into a food source. Anytime we send out a probe, it has to be kept in mind that it originated from Earth, which is of course absolutely infested with microbes. But that doesn't remove the mystery about how this contamination happened, and how it happened so rapidly to form a bacterial colony. So it's still unknown what the point of contamination was, even under very strict controls that were in place. It also doesn't really explain how rapidly life was able to contaminate material from an asteroid, an alien environment. This may have implications on the idea of lithopanspermia, that life can transfer inside rocks traveling between planets, as well as the idea of life on Earth itself. All life on Earth is genetically related, and it all comes from a common ancestor. One of the questions hidden in that is why abiogenesis didn't happen multiple times on Earth and lead to multiple separate overall genomes. Something prevented that, so far as we've seen. One of the possibilities is that other instances of life do exist here on the microbial scale, but we just don't know how to detect them. Another possibility is that abiogenesis is so incredibly rare that it simply hasn't happened a second time. But in that case, it seems odd, because if that were the case, life should not have arose on Earth the very first moment it possibly physically could, which it did, suggesting that either life got here through panspermia, or abiogenesis is not a rare process. The final possibility, however, is interesting. It's the idea that every niche where Earth life is possible every avenue, has been taken up by life on Earth, and that happened very rapidly, very early. That left literally no room for anything else to exist here, and whenever abiogenesis occurs on this planet, that new microorganism rapidly gets eaten or is otherwise outpaced by the pre-existent life until extinction results. The contamination of the Ryugu sample supports that in that the microorganisms responsible very rapidly colonized that rock, despite it being of extraterrestrial origin. So the takeaway overall is this. The contamination proves that, well, firstly, we're not as good as we think we are at sterilization and clean rooms. The second is that the extraterrestrial organic material originating from comets and asteroids can be used by microorganisms from Earth for metabolism and growth. That means that microorganisms may not prefer planets, strictly. And that warm asteroids like Ryugu, that once hosted the chemistry of liquid water, could have been in some way habitable for microbial life that might arise there as an abiogenesis event, or contaminated from an impact on Earth through lithopanspermia. Even though it was a contamination event, it still yielded interesting science, 
and it's quite clear that more discovery remains to be made about the early history of the solar system and what might have once lived here. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently very concerned about sample return missions. If you think about it, that idea goes both ways. Mars, Venus, the Moon, and several other places have received samples of Earth in the form of our probes, and they got them for free, whereas we spend billions for any sample returns we do. Doesn't seem right. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations to the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.